Hey everyone, uh, we're looking at the first bigger rotor here, which is ice. So this is a glacier. Well, no, this isn't a glacier. This is a floating piece of a glacier. It's called an iceberg. So icebergs are kind of like glaciers, uh, except they're just pieces off of the main sheet. A picture of a glacier would be something like this. This particular kind of glacier is called a valley glacier because it's between the valleys of the mountain. Or you could have the whole continent of Antarctica, which is a glacier that kind of covers the entire continent it kind of flattens out over all the entire region all right they call those continental glaciers for obvious reasons so how do glaciers form well we need to have snow and as it snows more and more you're going to get accumulations of the snow higher and higher and as the weight of the snow starts to compact those snowflakes at the bottom you can see in that image that the snowflakes kind of break down their crystalline structure and eventually turn into something called fern which is transition between the snowflake and ice until you finally get glacial ice. So if you get more snow in the winter than melts in summer, we get a glacier. So another way for a glacier to grow, like we said with the continental, is that since it's broad and wide, those layers of snow pile up on each other, creating pressure, and those bottom layers kind of push out in all directions. Okay, well valley glaciers or alpine glaciers form high in mountain areas. We can get a lot of snow, even in warm regions, in mountain areas, it's colder. So you can have uh, glaciers form basically anywhere. There's, and you can see here there are some glaciers at the tops of these mountains. Um, on the right hand side of the picture you can see the glacier actually pushing its way down the mountain. Since the ice can either go down the mountain or come back up the mountain, ice can flow. But how, how's that ice flow compared to river flow? Well, it's incredibly slow. As a matter of fact, if you look really closely here, you can see that there must be some melting going on because you can see it forming little rivers. So ice then really wouldn't be an eroder then, right? Because of the slow movement. Doesn't the slow movement create deposition? Well, in this particular case, you have a huge mass that's moving down the mountain. And so even though it's moving very slow, for this particular system, it is the fast motion. And therefore, you get some erosion as it moves down the mountain plus the size of the glacier. The glaciers are huge, so the mass of ice coming towards you, pulled down by gravity, gravity is the cause of the movement, pushes material out of the way. So it does erode things very slowly. It carves U-shaped valleys because of how wide they are. And the rubbing, the abrasion along the sides is kind of what plucks rocks from the ground and moves them from one place to another. Right, and in this picture here, you have something called striations, which are basically scratches made by glaciers, and that's a really good sign that glaciers have moved down through an area. What would loosen the rock bed underneath? That ice can get into the cracks and frost wedge, break rocks from the big pieces to the smaller pieces, and then move those pieces downhill. So what you're saying is that we have both weathering and erosion occurring at the same time. The glacier can break down the rock, and then, since it's so massive, push the rock further downhill. So massive it can create these big wide U-shaped valleys like you can see here in Yosemite. You see the big uh, bowl shape at the base of mountains. Creating lakes in some of those bowls. We can see that there's ridges. These ridges have steep sides to them because possibly a glacier went off the left side of the mountain and one went off the right side of the mountain. Due to the heavy weight, it left a peak running along the mountain here. And you'll notice the bowl shapes are on either sides of those ridges and the peaks are at the top. It all happens kind of in the same motion, but it happens over a really long period of time because it's such a slow action and it's a repeating process. Here is actually a cool thing. This is where two glaciers actually cut each other off. There was a glacier that came right through this section right here, kind of out towards you, but there was another glacier that went from, say, right to left across it, the front. And it basically cut off the path that the first glacier took, and they call that a hanging valley. And during times of melt, you get a lot of waterfalls along those areas. So let's go to the deposition side of glaciers. When glaciers drop off material, they drag that bits of rock. What are the sizes of the rocks that it can push? Well, it can push all kinds of different sizes. Huge things that you couldn't ever imagine even move with a bulldozer. And little tiny rocks that you can pick up and put in your pocket. It doesn't really discriminate between large and small sizes. It doesn't discriminate between sizes. What's happening is that at this point, the, the glacier is losing energy because it's melting. It's now at its slow point, which is actually not moving at all. It's just melting and leaving the rocks behind. And we call those rocks till for a very fancy name for 
rocks. So you can see in these two pictures on the left, you got a glacier that is far and very close to the camera. And then a few years later, we came back and we must have had warmer temperatures because the glacier is retreating and you can see all the melt water that's left behind along with piles of rock and debris. Here you can see on the left side one of those really big rocks that we spoke of and on the right side it's a huge mixture. You can see there are some smaller rocks and some larger rocks as well all along this pile of till that they left behind and we'll see a lot of different shapes of piles of till. Again you can see the edge of a glacier versus the left side where the glacier has left you can see the rocks piled up and you can see the ice retreating away. This particular one you can tell is the very last hill of till. This is called a moraine, but this is called an end moraine. The reason they call it an end moraine is because it's the very last pile of till. It's the furthest that the glacier's actually gotten. We can tell this because the trees ahead of it and the grass there haven't been scoured away. And if the glacier backs up and then halts for a few more years, it's gonna create a new hill of till. Right, and uh, here at Cape Cod, you can see, it was actually uh, made by a moraine. The bottom of the picture shows the end moraine. So a glacier came all the way down from the North Pole and reached all the way down into the U.S. Yes. So as far down as Boston and even in our area. Mm -hmm. So this is the plain, the flat area left behind when the ice retreats. Here are the braided streams that come off of the end, and the reason the streams are braided? Basically because there's so much till left behind that the stream needs to take the easiest path, and in this case the easiest path is to go around the till rather than bust through it, so it's basically a choked stream. These are hills that are made from older moraines that were kind of run over. So a glacier pushed to a certain area, dropped off a hill of till, and then maybe retreated, and then a few years later, we got a lot of ice accumulating, and it then ran right over old moraine, stretching out these long hills. Here you can see two different kinds of, of till. One type of till made a canoe-shaped uh, drumlin. The other type left a rock that apparently has been there for a really long time, because all these trees have grown around it. And if you want a local example, just go up to Moraine State Park. I wonder why they named it that. I couldn't even imagine. <laughs> so the glacier stopped in that area, dropped off all those little rocks you can see the girl standing on. To recap there, ice can weather rocks by frost wedging and breaking the rocks down into smaller pieces. It can abrade the rocks by carrying other pieces with it and rubbing them across the ground. How can it erode? Well, eroding just takes place by the ice advancing. And the way the ice advances, once again, is you get a lot of snow that doesn't melt. And so the ice keeps pushing its way down, pushing its way down the hill. It scratches, it plucks, it abrades, which is scratching. And what's the force that's causing the erosion? It's gravity. So then once gravity stops pushing it to its furthest amount and the glacier starts to melt, we said it will deposit and drop off any size object at the end of the glacier. At the ends or the sides. You can see moraines on the sides as well. Anything that's plucked or scraped is down there now. So if I just wanted to kind of look at uh, all these numbers here, five would be where the glacier originated. Four to me would be the outwash plain, that big area where the glacier was and then retreated, leaving behind braided streams. And right ahead of four there looks like it might be a moraine that left, got pushed up there by a glacier. Uh, three looks like he's standing on some moraines. Or drumlins or eskers or any number of Deposition. depositional feature. And one and two, you could call that till because it's just a random rock in the middle of nowhere, or I guess you could call it an erratic since it's a, a random rock, rock in the middle of nowhere. Sounds good. I think we need to take a trip to Moraine State Park. See you later.